so we're starting to record. Um, so thank you everyone uh, for for being here today. Um, the idea basically of today is to look at fellowship opportunities for studying with us at the Acoustics Research Centre at University of Salford, Focus mostly on the uh, Marie Curie scheme that has uh, got a deadline in this autumn. Uh, I'm Trevor Cox, I run the Acoustics Research Centre at Salford. And the basic outline of today would be, first of all, I'll just give you an overview for those who don't know the research centre, very briefly what it's all about. I'll then ask my colleagues at the various other people in the chat to talk very briefly about their different subject areas, give a sense of the kind of different things we do. I would say brief because if you do the multiplier of how many we have by, if you do more than five minutes, we'll be here for a very long time. So if you could literally keep it as brief as possible, that'd be great. And then we've got Vera Barron here, who uh, is very experienced in uh, bidding into Europe, or bidding generally anyway, who's going to outline the scheme and talk about it. And then I'll come back and talk about next steps um, and how we run uh, people applying for the scheme with us as a host. So that's the plan of attack. Um, so in terms of uh, who we are, just in some facts and figures, we're quite a large research group in acoustics. Um, We've been going quite a lot of decades, um, but we've got 12 academics, faculty like myself. We've got 10 commercial staff. One thing which makes us a bit unusual is we have a big commercial arm um, who do work for R&D work for industry. There's 10 of them. We have currently have six postdocs. I think it'll be seven soon, 20 or, 20 or so research students. And that's our sort of kind of income from research grants and commercial work. So we've got a, a variety of ways we fund our research ranging from EU funding, uh, UK grant funders through to actual companies paying us to do stuff as well. Um, in terms of what we have in facilities, we have world class facilities, um, a variety of things. There's our uh, reverberation chamber, which is part of the transmission suite. We have a big anechoic chamber. We have a couple of semi anechoic chambers. We have a couple of listening rooms. Uh, we have a, a calibration laboratory and alongside all that we have a vast array of measurement equipment, uh, Doppler laser vibrometers, acoustic cameras, but just every day sort of microphones, loudspeakers and analyzers and pulse systems, all sorts of stuff there as well. So if you come to do a fellowship with us, we undoubtedly probably have the measurement gear you need if it's a measurement based one. Um, and in terms of the research, I'm going to turn over to my colleagues to talk about specifically about the areas, but we are broadly set it into two sort of kind of areas. Uh, some of our work is based around health and well-being and accessibility. So that could be things like healthcare technologies. I work on hearing aids. Uh, it could be things about accessibility. Ben's on the call. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, Bill's going to talk about all diversity. It could be using sound as a positive thing. I see Duncan's on the call. He'll say a bit about that. But it could also be about the perpetual problem of noise in the world um, and uh, how we deal with that. So a whole variety. I've also added bioacoustics in there. I'm not sure where to fit it into my two categories, but we've also got a growing amount of work around acoustics, uh, noise, really, and animals. And then the uh, the other area of research we get to is about industrial acoustics. Um, so the, the commercial unit splits into three groups. There's a centre for built environment, so that's architectural and building acoustics. Uh, we're just about to uh, announce we're the National Institute for Airborne Acoustic Metrology, hopefully. So that's all about calibration, microphones and stuff like that. Um, and we've also got a big group doing vibro acoustics, structure borne sound through products, through cars, for all sorts of kind of things. Alongside that in industrial stuff, we have material work um, like porous absorbers and metamaterials. E-mobility is a big area. I see Antonio's on the call, no doubt, say something about that. Uh, engineering informed by perception is a very important area of our work. And we've got some new stuff starting up on high intensity testing. So that means testing it. I don't know if John's going to say anything about that, but that's testing things like satellites at very high sound pressure levels. Um, audio systems, we've had a variety of grants, say, for example, with BBC R&D about audio. Uh, computer modelling, no doubt John will mention, and machine learning. I don't think Francis is here, but uh, we do a quite a lot of machine learning work. So I hope that gives you a sense of some of the areas that we touch on, but I'm going to ask individual staff to say three to five minutes max about their area. Um, and it's I can't remember what order I'm going to have, so we'll have a surprise. First of all, it's you, Bill. OK, um, hi, everyone. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm Bill Davis. 
Um, that's not a photo of, of, of me. That's a, a, a much more handsome younger man uh, called James, uh, who um, who was a postdoc um, here, and there he is wearing some eye tracking goggles. And the uh, uh, and the graph below is uh, is a kind of example of, of uh, actually a piece of work that, that James did, but one of the sort of things that uh, uh, that I've worked on in uh, psychoacoustics, um, sort of human perceptual response to uh, sound, where uh, we were able to uh, track um, or use pupil dilation as a, a sort of biological marker um, of informational masking. So when you uh, you're distracted from hearing a, a sound because of the informational content in a, in another sound. So the, the sound is available for you to hear, but but you don't hear it or you don't consciously process it uh, because there's too much other stuff um, going on. So I suppose that's a kind of particularly sort of uh, specific example of, of the kinds of things that uh, that I do. Um, I started off originally in, in room acoustics, but got more and more interested in questions uh, like why does one room sound better than another and what does better mean anyway? Um, why do people prefer the sound of one thing over another? I'm probably best known for my work in, in soundscapes. Um, I led something called the Positive Soundscape Project, which I had to uh, develop ways of measuring um, uh, sort of response to, <clears throat> excuse me, to positive sound in the outdoor environment. So, you know, it's not all just noise level. Uh, there are interesting, exciting, calming soundscapes as well. And how do we evaluate those? At the moment, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm particularly interested in the idea of oral diversity, which was, uh, or aural diversity, as some people pronounce it, but that always makes me think of owls. Um, but it's not to do with owls, uh, it's to do with hearing. It's the idea, uh, John Drever uh, coined this uh, this term, it's the, uh, it sort of builds on the, the, uh, the neurodiversity movement. It's the idea that uh, there is a great distribution of uh, hearing and processing sound amongst, amongst humans to the extent that uh, almost everybody uh, hears a little bit differently from everybody else and the sort of division of um, of humans into normal hearing and impaired hearing uh, is just about as dumb as as dealing with uh, all uh, all sound as noise um, and so oral diversity is attempting to sort of explore well what would this mean for uh, the way in which we sort of design the the sound of everything um, so it certainly impinges on, on accessibility, which uh, which I think Ben will talk about later on, but also sort of fundamental ideas about uh, uh, how we can characterise how, how people uh, process sound differently. And instead of using one sort of mean normal hearing model, uh, could we replace that with a, with a sort of distribution? Um, oh yes, as Trevor has just put up in the chat, I'm running a two day workshop uh, uh, on this uh, in a couple of weeks uh, time, if you're interested in finding more about that. Right, I'll shut up now. Yeah, thank you very much, Bill. Um, so we'll move on to, it looks like it's John next. If you three to five minutes, John. Sure, hello, thanks, thanks for this. Uh, so I've got quite a lot of stuff on here, um, which I'll try and pick apart. I guess it. I think my interests are growing as time goes on. Uh, most of you probably know me for working computer simulation algorithms. I can see a couple of you here that were on the summer school I co-organised last year, which is which is nice. Nice to see you again. Um, and and that's kind of where everything stems from, I suppose. That's where my PhD was. But as time has, has gone on, uh, I've got more and more interested in the sort of confluence of this with measurement. I mean, obviously, you know, simulation algorithms aren't an end to themselves. You've got to simulate something. So we're going to be interested in something in the real world. But also you sort of find as time goes on that often you, it's all well and good having an algorithm on a computer, but you don't actually have the measurement data to, to put into it to actually simulate things so they're they're right. So there's there's stuff on here uh, on the lower left about 
uh, source characterization, lower middle about uh, material characterization that might involve use of microphone arrays um, on the bottom right, or might use something like laser Doppler vibrometry, um, which Trevor mentioned we've got a laser Doppler, or two laser Doppler vibrometers actually in the department. Um, and um, so that might be sort of ways that you try and characterize items in this scene or, or, or material data better to get a better match between simulation and measurement. And at the end, you might want to listen to it as well. And I've done work on oralization, and that's another interesting area, which is kind of pushing off into the virtual and augmented reality kind of spheres. At the top right, we've got some other stuff, which is again more about kind of applications of, of modeling, I suppose, because I would probably usually wheel out modeling as a, as a first way of doing any of these things. Uh, so we might be interested in uh, loudspeakers. There's a, there's a picture there of a Bowers and Wilkins loudspeaker and a picture from one of my friend's PhDs actually where he did some work on modeling this. Uh, there's a rather unusual loudspeaker in the center that's axisymmetric that was um, done for a student project that was was good fun. Uh, oh, thank you, <laughs> the pointer. Uh, and then there's a, a funny little um, compression driver waveguide on the right hand side, which is another thing I've been working for on recently. Uh, in the middle, um, we have these four big things that look rather like tanks around in a small box. Uh, this is an example of some high intensity acoustic testing. These are large loudspeakers, um, best part the size of a car actually, uh, which um, are, are produced by a certain uh, company for doing um, high intensity acoustic testing. This test was about 147 dB or something like that, I think. Um, we saw a facility last week actually in the Northwest went to visit that was over 170. So people are doing some, some crazy sound pressure levels. And I'm interested in that from a kind of practical PA and theoretical kind of standpoint. You know, how do you design metrics to, to you know, check that this is working properly? Um, and that's an area we're moving into. And actually, we're going to have a funded PhD um, on that coming up very soon as well, which we'll be advertising. Finally, I'm quite interested in live sound. Um, and this was a photo from a student project on uh, predicting feedback uh, and, and, and doing things about it to fix on stage stuff. So quite a range of things. Thank you, Trevor. Thanks very much, John. Um, so it's over to you, Duncan, if you want to give us three or four minutes on your subject area. Yep, sure. Hi, folks. So um, my name's Duncan Williams. I'm a lecturer here in uh, acoustics and audio engineering. And my work is really about the power of sound and music. So I'm interested in how we can use sound and music to help us live better lives. First of all, by understanding our responses to those things. And secondly, by building tools which will assist us with those things. So to give you some more specific examples um, of that, one use for music is that it can help people uh, to move, not just dancing, but also to help them running or exercising. Um, so I've worked on projects creating new music based on people's uh, biophysiological reactions. So their heart rate, their step size, their gait to encourage them to move up and down a hill in Cornwall. Um, that's a very specific example. Uh, a lot of the images you'll see on the screen are using different kinds of biosensors, which I suppose is what most of my work over the last five or 10 years has been about. Um, this strange looking swimming cap with sensors on is an electroencephalograph. I think Trevor's pointing at it there. Um, that's the wrapper Tiny Temper um, using a system that we built to translate brain waves into a MIDI musical generator. Uh, over on the left um, is Amy Williams, no relation. Um, Amy was an Olympic uh, skeleton, uh, I think it's called, which is a kind of a bobsled Winter Olympic uh, athlete. Um, and she's playing here with the system which used the same kind of technology to select music automatically from a Spotify type of playlist based on her mood. Um, the other stuff that you'll see is uh, slightly different using games and audio based games to encourage people to get out into the open and engage with the environment. So again, how can we use new kinds of music technology, new kinds of sound devices to encourage positive behavior, basically? So I don't do a huge amount with noise, um, which I suppose would be the opposite end of the scale, but the techniques would still probably be applicable. 
So if you're interested in biosensors or music making tools or the power of sound to encourage positive behaviour, I would love to work with you. I think that's about it for me. Thank you very much, Duncan. That was a nice, nice quick summary. Now I'll, I'll spend 20 minutes saying what I do. Uh, no, I'll, I'll keep it quick. Uh, so yes, I'm, as you know, I'm already, I'm Trevor Cox. Uh, so I'm a professor of acoustics. Um, and my original area of work actually was around diffusers, which is, we're seeing a meta diffuser here, which is something I worked on. Well, Noe Jimenez led that particular work. He did a lot of it and I helped him out with that work. Um, so I'm very interested in materials that are used in architecture, uh, and other places. And we've got other people who aren't on the call today who do work on things like metamaterials as well. So we have quite a strong group on material work. Uh, the other two people just don't happen to be on the call today because they've got other commitments. Um, and that was all feeding into architectural acoustics, which was my original area. Recently gone and looked at very unusual architectural acoustics. This is actually a, a model of Stonehenge. So I've got an interest not only in architectural acoustics, but in archaeoacoustics. Um, Bruno Fazenda, my colleague, is particularly into our acoustics. If you're interested in that, get in contact with me because Bruno's currently away for a month and I can talk to you about that as well. Um, we've done quite a lot of big projects on audio. This is uh, media device orchestration that we developed with BBC R&D and various other universities to do ad hoc arrays to create surround sound, which is another area. And my two most recent grants have actually been on hearing aids. We've got one just started or just about to start on hearing aids for music. And we've got one which is midway of running, which is hearing aids for speech. They're both using a challenge methodology where we set challenges for people uh, and the team is actually running those challenges as a way of building a community to try and make hearing aid processing better for speech and for music. Um, so if you're really interested in that stuff, you can enter the enhancement challenge at claritychallenges.org, which is just launched about two or three weeks ago. So that kind of gives you a sense. I suppose one thing I haven't mentioned again, the other person who does a lot of this isn't here is machine learning as a tool to model stuff. You do a lot of work in that and have traditionally done work going back into the 90s in that. Another colleague, Francis Lee, also does work in that, but just happens to be not here today. He's got other commitments. Uh, so, Ben, if you want to talk a bit about uh, your accessible audio work. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, I'm Ben Shirley, so I do quite a lot of work on accessible and personalised audio and a lot of this has been on making broadcast sound better for people with hearing impairments um, and certainly in the last ooh, 12 years this has been focused on next generation audio formats and the kind of formats that allow your set top box or your smart tv to do some of the mixing of the program material for you so if you're hearing impaired you may want more dialogue there's some more there's other sounds which you, you need more of, probably less of some of the background noise. And in this centre <coughs> centre section here, picture with some work we did with the BBC where we developed this idea of using narrative importance to define what objects were most, what audio objects were most important for people with hearing impairments. Um, the top right is some more work working with DTS, doing similar kind of work where we're splitting down sound into categories again and essentially remixing the sound at the TV for the specific viewers needs. And there's been a lot of this work working with DTS, with Fraunhofer, with Dolby, with all the, the, the major kind of broadcast technology companies that work with this next generation audio. This is now kind of extended and now also working with the RNIB on looking at how we can personalize audio for people with visual impairment. We've done one study on how what what would make good TV sound for people with dementia, for example. And all of these next generation audio formats have been focused largely on broadcast, although we're just starting to look at how some of the same kind of techniques can be moved into virtual reality, augmented reality, extended reality, and so on. And that's everything from improving it, improving the dialogue to moving things around so you're unmasking things and just down to simple preference. So watching a football game, do you want to hear the home crowd or the away crowd? Do, do you want the commentator, the biased commentator or the unbiased commentator and so on? So it's everything from accessibility for people with specific needs right the way through to more kind of enjoyment, engagements and entertainment for other people based on personalising audio. Thanks very much, Ben. I'm not sure there's such a thing as an unbiased commentator discuss. Anyway, <laughs> um, so Antonio, uh, Antonio 
Teresa Martinez. Do you want to just, because uh, your name's not in full, I thought I'd say it out loud. Um, <laughs> you just got your Twitter handle. You've gone all yeah. native with Twitter. Anyway, tell us a little bit about, about your research. Yeah, so thank you, Trevor. <clears throat> so I'm working mainly on uh, environmental acoustics, uh, although my main focus at the moment is e-mobility. E so I'm just uh, putting here three projects I'm working at the moment. On the uh, top uh, left uh, corner, we have uh, a couple of projects I'm working on, on drones and uh, urban air um, mobility. So the idea here is uh, to quantify the noise emission of these novel vehicles, whether it's a drone or something bigger like a, a flying taxi. So we can quantify uh, so we can quantify the potential impact on communities. What are the technologies we can uh, implement in order to reduce uh, community noise impact? So our approach is a bit different to other uh, uh, groups working on the area because we are trying to develop psychoacoustic uh, uh, focus techniques. So we are uh, aiming to include the uh, human response or noise perception in the design cycle in the design cycle of uh, of these new vehicles. So that's to minimize noise in the on the right of the of the of the of the slide. We have a different project again, focus on e-mobility, but in this case is a micro mobility. Uh, so uh, we have a potential problem with uh, scooters, electric scooters operating in cities. That might be an issue for the safety of uh, pedestrians, uh, particularly for groups of uh, blind or partially sighted people. So what we are doing is carefully uh, investigating what are the uh, warning signals we can add in a, a scooter so we uh, find the balance between noticeability of the vehicles without significantly increasing increasing annoyance. So a couple of pictures there is uh, uh, our experimental setup uh, for the measurements and also the virtual reality experiment we, we ran uh, in a feasibility study last year. We are continuing with this research in the safe and sound project. You have you have the link there for some information. And we are glad to see that the, this project is getting some attention. And for example, you have a you have an article published in The Guardian there about our research. And the other thing I'm working on is uh, novel uh, methods for environmental acoustics. <clears throat> so I'm working with my colleague uh, Bill Davis. You heard uh, Bill Davis before on a KTP knowledge transfer uh, partnership with a company here in the UK for uh, the further development of their noise app so we can include more capabilities to enhance the analysis someone can someone could do with a with a smartphone from a from an acoustic point of view for example the classification of sounds or even using a, a smartphone as a as a calibrated uh, sound level meter so you can have uh, reliable measurements uh, using that um, that smartphone so these are, uh, in general terms, the, the areas I'm, I'm working at the moment. Happy to discuss any potential uh, research in environmental acoustics, immobility, e etc. OK, thank, thanks ever so much, my colleagues. As I said, there's a few others who couldn't be here today because they've got teaching commitments or other things going on. Um, we'll talk about next steps. Well, one of the next steps would be if you're interested in someone's area, which broadly matches the, where you want to research in, uh, get in contact with them and have a chat about, you know, finding out is there something mutually of interest that you can do. Um, but first of all, we need to go into this scheme in a bit more detail. I'm very glad that uh, Veer Barron's here, who's incredibly experienced at, um, I'm going to do the next steps later, um, about bidding into such schemes. So Veer, if I could turn over to you to sort of kind of outline the scheme and talk about it in some detail, please. Sure. So I've got just a couple of slides to kind of introduce the scheme and uh, hopefully we'll have time for some questions if, if colleagues have any specific questions about the scheme after uh, at the end of the presentation. So we really wanted to promote the Maris Korska Curie Actions uh, postdoctoral fellowships because they are an in a great opportunity to invite uh, colleagues from all over the world to come and basically spend time in the Acoustics Research Centre at the University of Salford and to be really embedded into the the, the, the team of experts that we have contribute your own research expertise, but also learn uh, or get a different uh, sort of opportunity to, to learn from, from colleagues uh, in, in the ARC. The, um, these fellowships are aimed at uh, researchers who already have a doctoral degree and wish to enhance their, their creativity, their innovation potential um, uh, through acquisition of new skills through further research. 
These fellowships can take either place in Europe. So obviously we are hoping to, to welcome colleagues from anywhere in the world, including the European Union at Salford, or in a third country not associated to Horizon Europe. So these are global post postdoctoral fellowships that would take place for colleagues who wish to leave, uh, sort of, you know, have an experience of leaving Salford for up to two years and work in another institution. But I think today, the purpose of today is to really focus on the European fellowship. These fellowships can last for up to 24 months. And the call I have included, the details about the call uh, will open actually tomorrow with a deadline for submission of the proposal um, set for 14th of September 2022. So now is a really good time to consider um, developing an application and finding the right host if you're interested. I've also included the, the website to the link so that you can refer to the call uh, information uh, later. OK, could I have the next slide, please, Trevor? <clears throat> So yeah, so I just wanted to kind of uh, summarize the two postdoctoral fellowship types. So we are looking at the European postdoctoral fellowship, which is, as I've said, open to researchers of any nationality that wish to engage in RNI projects uh, by coming, in this case, to the University of Salford. I've also mentioned already that the standard duration of these is between 12 and 24 months. But in, in my experience, I would say that the vast majority of fellowships take place up to two, for up to two years. And it's actually quite difficult to justify um, to the Commission uh, if you want to just uh, basically apply for 12 month fellowship in terms of the, the knowledge transfer and having enough time for the knowledge transfer to take place between you as a fellow and between the host institution. So in my personal experience of uh, supporting these fellowships over the last 15 years, I would say that the vast majority of successful projects last two, two years. OK, next slide, please. So um, I wanted to talk about some important aspects that that you need to consider or we all need to consider for a successful proposal. And these are the fact that you are also eligible uh, to apply for secondments, which can take place for up to a third of the duration of the fellowship in any country. So, for example, um, if you had a really interesting um, or if you had a couple of senior colleagues in other institutions and you felt that your project was um, uh, would really benefit from spending some time in a specific laboratory or research center, we could include this into the proposal. So this can this can be a single period of time or you can also divide your sequence into shorter mobility periods, whichever kind of suits your needs uh, in terms of your personal circumstances. If you have family commitments. Um, these comments are really welcome and are, they are considered as a novelty in the new program and I think they are really welcome by the evaluators so it's something that we would discuss uh, as you develop your application. They of course need to be in line with the project objectives adding significant value and impact to the fellowship. The other novelty to the program in this year score is uh, um, placements in non-academic sector so you can add up to six additional months to support researchers seeking a placement at the end of the project. Um, we, one thing I would say, you know, this is really important specifically for us as a hosting institution, we have to engage on the, um, in conversation with those partners as soon as possible because we need to include a letter of support from the non-academic partner in the, with the application in order for the placement to be recognised at the evaluation stage. The other two or three really important sections to think about when you are thinking about your fellowship would be what sort of training do you want to get out of this? So this, this is really important. And what can we as a host institution offer to you as a suitable or successful candidate? So what are the key transferable skills, for example, in terms of entrepreneurship, commercialization, uh, communication, public engagement, citizen science? So all of these things would be something that we would discuss and we would develop a very strong uh, plan in terms of the training to help that help you foster, uh, you know, develop your career further. And the last requirement that I wanted to mention, which is really important, in addition to, of course, scientific excellence, is the career development plan. So the purpose of these fellowships is to help colleagues develop uh, into future leaders, scientific leaders. And this should be so the career development plan is something we will be discussing again jointly with the supervisors and and yourselves. And in addition to research objectives, this plan should really comprise um, your training and career needs. Um, what's your plan for publications? What's your plan for raising your profile in the scientific or non-scientific community, depending on sort of where you want your career to go? Um, this would be an output that we would actually include in the proposal and also in your specific work plan. So this is something that we would talk through as we start developing the application as well. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> 
I just wanted to talk a little bit about the eligibility. So this is something that is really important for us to consider at the very beginning of the conversation to make sure that uh, you know we we submit uh, eligible applications and that you are in the right stage of your career if you are uh, considering uh, applying for the fellowship. So the guidance states really clearly that you have to be a postdoctoral researcher at the day, date of the call deadline. Um, but also applicants who have successfully defended their doctoral thesis but have not yet formally been awarded the degree are also considered as postdoctoral researchers. So that's a really good um, addition. The, there is a time limit on the number of full time experience of, in research, and that's eight years measured from the date of the award of your doctoral degree. So this is just to ensure that the um, the application or, or this call is a level playing field in terms of the experience of the fellows that are applying. So this scheme is really aimed at mid-career researchers who want to further their careers. There is also a mobility <coughs> rule, and this is really important, uh, again, for colleagues who are joining um, Salford from, from other member states or from, from rest of the world. So the rule is that you must not have resided or carried out your main activity in the country of the host uh, for more than 12 months in the three years immediately prior to the call deadline. So this is, again, something we would be kind of we could discuss if you have any concerns or issues. But these are really important eligibility criteria that we have to comply with in order for the project to be eligible. OK, next slide, please. So I just wanted to give you a feel for how much funding is available. So for this call, there is the allocation is 219 million for the European Fellowship call, which will fund approximately 900 projects across the EU and associated countries space. In terms of the award that's available to, to the individual fellows, the budget is formulaic and uh, basically it is driven by a monthly allowance for a living allowance, which is essentially paid to the researcher as a salary, which is currently set at 5,000 euros per month. It also includes the institutional on costs. So any tax that you would have to pay and any tax that we, or sorry, any national contributions that we would as an employer have to pay to the government. There is also mobility allowance, which is also paid as a salary. Um, if applicable, uh, the EU also offers family, long-term leave or special needs allowance, which is set at 660 uh, euros per month. Uh, the uh, fellowship also offers research and training um, budget, which is set at 1000 euros per month. And also it offers management and indirect cost contribution towards basically the institutional overheads. So, so the researchers benefit from the living allowance, mobility allowance, uh, any other allowances, and also the, a fairly, I would say, generous research and training budget. So when we look at the total value of the fellowship, it's any anywhere between 220 to 300,000 euros, depending on the length of your project and the allowances that you apply for as an individual candidate. Okay, may I have the next slide, please? OK, and I just wanted to say that actually this is a really great time to start talking and promoting um, these sessions because there are uh, various platforms which are which have been kind of facilitated by the EU Commission to allow us to either advertise Salford as a, a eager host or to allow people um, <clears throat> to, to basically match with us. So there are matchmaking platforms. There's also a specific core web page which includes the partner search uh, uh, announcements but also the Euro Access platform is a, essentially a dissemination tool for recruitment um, across the EU uh, for the benefit of the program participation. So I just wanted to highlight these. I also wanted to let you know that um, the UK Research Office based in Brussels recently delivered a series of webinars that are also available. So please let me know, drop me a message and I can share with you the details of the of the recordings if you want to find out a bit more about this, uh, this program. And last but not least, I wanted to say that um, the scheme is essentially a huge bottom-up opportunity to increase interdisciplinary collaboration in Europe. But it is re what's really nice about the Maurice Kolska Curie actions is that they are open to any nationality. They are completely bottom-up, and their sole um, purpose, if you like, or objective, is to increase the mobility, interdisciplinary research in Europe, and to support the future careers of researchers. So this is the whole point of the program. And it's a great opportunity for us to basically share the um, Acoustics Research Center uh, with uh, colleagues from all over the world by inviting them to spend time with us and to, to do research with, with us. Uh, thank you very much for that, Vera. I'll just outline some next steps and then we'll go over to questions. Um, so if you go to our website, and there's the URL there, you'll find on the right hand side is a link to this webinar which has details 
uh, about stuff that you need. Um, and basically, if you're interested in a particular research area, you've, you've heard from some of the staff, contact them direct. There's a list there on the website or you can email me direct and say, who should I talk to about this? And start having a conversation to see if there's research that you'll be mutually in interested in. Because we want to make sure we go do the best possible applications to the EU, we have a process by which we ask people to fill in an expression of interest form for us to be a host. So this is internal to Salford. The form is up on that website. You fill that in and submit it uh, by the start of next month. And then we basically pick the best of people who have expressed interest, the ones who are most likely to succeed, who we then take forward and support in the bid to the EU. So that's a purely internal Salford thing. And the idea there is to make sure we're supporting the best bids that have got the best chances of being funded and also to manage the number of people who might want to be interested in, in us as hosts. So we have a reasonable number of bids, all of high quality. Now, we will turn around quite quickly a, a, you know, a choice of who will go forward. Uh, and then we'll be working towards the 14th of September deadline, which is when you actually submit to Horizon Europe for funding. And we will help you make the best possible bid. So we had one funded in the last round and we worked very intensely with that postdoc to actually make sure the bid met all the guidance that was required and had the best possible chance of scoring as highly as possible. So we're very experienced in the team of bidding for money and unlocking money. And we'd be delighted to help out the people who get through the expression of interest to put forward the best possible bids to the EU, because that's in our interest as well as yours as well. So that's the kind of next step. So the next step would be to essentially apply to Salford to, have, to be taken forward as, with us as host, but then the big deadline for Europe at the end of September or mid-September, should I say. Vera, you wanted to say something, please jump in. Thank you. I just wanted to also um, outline the uh, basically the timeline for, for this call. So the call closes on 14th of September. The uh, evaluation will take place early in the new year and uh, the um, su successful applicants will be notified in February 2023. The EU Commission then starts the contract negotiation process, which takes place any time or, or between March and June 2023. But projects will be allowed to start depending on how quickly we, you know, contracts are negotiated from March 2023. So just to give you a feel of how for how quickly you could start uh, or take up the fellowship, it will be any time from March 2023. Yes, and I think we should also add, which we didn't say, that the UK government are underwriting this scheme. So, for example, whatever's happening currently between the EU and UK over the Northern Ireland issue doesn't really affect this so the person who's got our fellowship this year for the eu will be funded by the uk government if the two entities can't work out their differences beforehand so the uk government is underwriting the scheme um mm -hmm. so I, I think you should mention that as well that's a really good point and just want i wanted to say that um i've checked the uh, guidelines from the eu commission this morning when i was preparing for the seminar and it still uh, basically uh, basically nominates or designates the uk as um a, a sort of associated country with imminent association so as far as the eu is uh, concerned as well we are you know we have uh, gone through the legal process it's really just a, a matter of finalizing the association to the program OK, so I think we've got through to the end of the things that we wanted to say. I'm going to stop the recording so we can have a Q&A without uh, recording people's uh, 